Hello, welcome to Group 7's video project. I am Kyle Espinosa and I am representing on behalf of my peers Dionisa, Marlo, Jackson, Chase, Sadie, Rebecca, and Brooke. In this video, we will be uncovering Etienne Louis Bouly's life as an architect and how his works have impacted the study of architecture. Born on February 12, 1728 in Paris, France, Etienne Louis Bouly entered the scene during a neoclassical period of art. Influenced by many artists of the time, like Antonio Canova and Jacques-Louis David, Bouly was drawn to following his passion in painting, but his father had insisted on pursuing a safer career like architecture. He went on to study architecture with Jacques-France Blondel and Germain Beaufrand, and opened his own studio by the age of 19. With his background in painting, his designs leaned heavily towards artistically pleasing with great focus on size. Bouly was much more passionate about creating interesting and complex building plans than something practical and boring. Many architects hope to become larger than life figures in their lifetime, creating monolithic and exaggerated works that they hope will outlast their lives. Only a few people accomplish this feat, like Etienne and Louis Bouly, relegated to the history books not for his work but for his theories and teachings. Although not highly regarded as an architect during his time, he was seen as a great mentor to his students. His designs and legacy were only preserved through the essay on the art, which was only maintained because of his disciples. Belief fostered the next generation of European architects with his neoclassical and borderline modernist ideas. Neoclassicism was a movement from the 17 and 1800s that developed in Europe as a reaction to the excesses of Rococo and Baroque. The movement aimed to return to the classical beauty and magnificence of the ancient Greek and the Roman empires. Neoclassical architecture and art is based on simplicity and symmetry and Bouly serves as a perfect example of neoclassical architect. Bouly, through his work, achieved a long-lasting influence as a teacher and theorist. He taught for 50 years influencing the work of his students and partners with his distinct geometric style focusing on the removal of all ornamentation. His ideals were very progressive as many centuries later these beliefs were popularized by Adolf Loos in his writing Ornament and Crime in which he states, Absence of ornament has brought the other arts to unsuspected heights. For Bali, symmetry, regularity, and variety were the focal points of architecture. Additionally, Bali's method of design created a division between architecture as a pure art form and architecture as a science. He made a remark saying that it is this product of the mind, this process of creation, that constitutes architecture and which can consequently be defined as the art of designing and bringing to perfection any building whatsoever. Thus, the art of constitution is merely an auxiliary art which, in our opinion, could appropriately be called the scientific side of architecture. He acknowledged the importance of the technical side of architecture and the patience, the practice, of safe building methods as it is a necessary part of forming an idea which is derived from nature. However, he also acknowledges that the beauty of art cannot be depicted by mathematical equations. He delved into the history of monumental forms from cultures predating the Greeks and Romans and remixed classic elements in a way which had never been achieved before. He sought an unchangeable architecture imagining his ideas through spatial forms and placed great emphasis on the sphere as he regarded it as the ideal form. Of his numerous projects, although most unrealized, one in particular clearly illustrates his ideals of architectural representation. That is the proposed Isaac Newton Memorial or Xenotaph. This project is the epitome of Bully's use of simple geometric shapes in association with the manipulation of light as a way of producing a painting-like reality. Newton in Bully's eyes represented the pinnacle of man's ability to comprehend and influence the natural order of the universe. Therefore, Newton was the ideal subject for the totalizing architecture that Bully had in mind. The project was to be a perfect sphere intended to represent Newton's discovery of the law of gravitation, which set the Earth's and Moon's orbits around the Sun. As a result, day and night would each be depicted in opposition to their natural reference, and the monument would therefore have a both temporal and spatial continuity with the environment surrounding it in real time. The connection to the Roman pantheon is evident, but so is Bully's attempt to translate the universal symbolism 
of the ancient structure into a much more focused and direct form of depiction. The Newton Xenotaph has a direct connection to the nature that goes beyond what is immediately apparent. Another immense project designed by Boulay that emulated his emphasis on massive spatial forms was the Metropolitan Cathedral in Paris, as seen in Figure 2. Although unbuilt, the cathedral further shows his inspiration behind it coming from Greek architecture. However, he was also driven by a search for pure forms derived from nature by cultures that predated the Greeks. The central dome in the cathedral was originally based on St. Genevieve's final Ren-inspired design. However, Boulay changed it to have a biaxially symmetrical form with each arm of the cross being treated equally, as shown in figure 3. This overwhelming order of the four temple fronts was to cause the beholder to experience a feeling of veneration at the mere sight of the building and to inspire in him the profound respect that results from religious belief, according to Boulay. The transcendent cathedral was striking, not only because of its symmetry and massive size, but also the fact that it had a complete lack of windows. This was due to Boulay's critique of modern architects that substituted decorative windows for grand colonnades. To quote Boulay, he wanted a more magnificent and elegant appearance to his cathedral. By going beyond previous limits, but also incorporating pure forms, Boulay remixed classic elements at a scale and level of drama that was previously unachieved. In his time, Bouillet was not very influential, only having a real impact on those who had more exposure to his ideas from being taught by him. In the centuries since his life, he has been rediscovered, along with his essay La Terre des Corps and book Architecture Essay sur l'Art, which remained unpublished until the 20th century. Although classified as an Enlightenment architect, he only has one built project, called Hotel Alexandre, and his existing works are primarily drawings. Among his notable students are Alexandre Théodore Bognard, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, and Jean-François Thérèse Chagrin. Bognard was a distinguished French architect who was also a pupil of Bouillet. He designed Parisian townhouses, Hôtel du Montesquieu, Rue Monsieur, Hôtel du Bourbon Comte in a simple neoclassical style, and also designed the Elysee at Martepuy and worked on design for the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, which the Jardin Anglo-Chinois became a burial ground, a conception that would have influence on the designs of cemeteries going forward. His other influential project in Paris, Bourse, embodied many theories of Cordemois and Perrault. Durand was an important theorist and teacher who worked for the designer of the Pont de la Concorde, jean rudolphe Perronet, and later became professor of architecture at the École Polytechnique. His lectures, published as Précis des leçons d'architecture données à l'École Polytechnique, were widely influential, especially in Prussia, and his book, Recuel et Parallèle des Édifices de tout genre, was the first organized by building type to deal with historical architecture. His system of design using simple, repetitive, modular elements anticipated industrialized building components. Charles, Charles Grand built the Hôtel Saint Florentin, in which he was responsible for the neoclassical style courtyard screen, portal, and interior decor. He was a developer of an influential neoclassical style and designer of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, which has two main axes. He also designed the Saint-Philippe du Rolle church and was part of the reintroduction of the Basilican style in early Christian fashion, which avoided Baroque excess. He also completed Servandoni's Saint-Sulpice, designed several gardens, including one in Versailles, remodeled the Palais du Luxembourg, creating the neoclassical Salle Saucenay and Grand Staircase. Etienne Louis Boulay stands as an influential figure in neoclassical and to some extent modernist architectural history. Although his projects seldom saw physical manifestation, his forward-thinking approach to architecture inspired his pupils, many of which went on to be much more notable than he. Over the nearly 50-year course of his academic career as a teacher, Boulay became an architect to satisfy his father's disapproval of a career in painting. His connections to painting are perhaps the reason his projects took on such grandiose and visionary principles, yet despite this, he still treaded the line between architecture as an art and architecture as a science, recognizing the beauty of a built realization and also the technical necessity of it. 
An artist and forward thinker at heart, for much of his career he sought to foster these characteristics in his students, many of whom would professionally exceed him with their built projects and more practical architectural ideas, such as Jean-Francois Chagrin, who designed the Hotel Saint-Florentin, or Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, who wrote Prissy des Leçons d'Architecture. His notability has carried over into the modern age, with a film in the 80s titled The Belly of an Architect by Peter Greenaway showcasing many of his works. Both in his own practice and in his influence, Boulet served to upholster the ideas of neoclassical architecture with a return to classical Greek and Roman-inspired beauty and emphasis on symmetry and simplicity at the core.